So it's February the 18th, 2021. This is part four of the interview of Dana Scott, Turing Award winner. Dana is in Berkeley. I'm Gordon Plotkin. I'm in Edinburgh. And we'll begin. Dana, how did you become involved in computer science and start to work with the backer? Well, uh, I think we covered some of it uh, before. Uh, I had, uh, of course, long experience with recursive function theory. Uh, and then uh, it was uh, uh, 1957 that I worked with uh, Rabin. And then 1958, I uh, programmed on the uh, Institute for Advanced Machine, uh, Institute Machine that uh, von Neumann uh, built uh, while the university still had it for a short uh, period there. And so I had some background in, uh, background in uh, early, very, very early computers. Uh, and then I'm a little bit uh, confused about the exact date that we're talking about here. Uh, when I, when I, uh, uh, during the uh, postdoc period at uh, Chicago, I really didn't have any uh, uh, inter intersection with uh, uh, development of uh, uh, computer departments of computer science. But when I uh, got to uh, Berkeley in 1960, uh, things were just starting to uh, develop there. And the key thing was that uh, I was introduced to uh, Algol uh, 50, Algol 58, I guess at that time. Uh, maybe it was Algol 60, I'm sorry. Uh, Rene de Vogelaer was a uh, numerical analyst. He was very, very enthusiastic about uh, Algol. And so he was doing a lot of proselytizing. And then there was some movement to get a computer science department started at uh, Berkeley, uh, different from the electrical engineering department, but that took some years uh, to evolve and I wasn't directly uh, concerned with that because I had moved to uh, Stanford. Then at Stanford, uh, I, had, uh, I lectured on automata theory and had connections with many people uh, involved with the newly evolving computer science department that George Forsythe started at uh, Stanford. And then of course, that was the time that McCarthy came to Stanford and started his uh, AI lab as well. And so I was connected with those people, though I was not directly uh, working with anyone. It was uh, while I was at Stanford that I took a sabbatical in 68, 69, that I went to Amsterdam and uh, renewed friendships with many of the Dutch logicians. Uh, I lectured on uh, uh, set theory and uh, on model theory. <clears throat> but in the spring, Pat Supis had uh, recommended me to join the IFIP working group 2.2. And uh, as I wrote to you, uh, Gordon, uh, earlier, I looked yeah. up the history there. So apparently it was in the spring that was the meeting that I went to where I first met uh, Strachey. Yeah. Uh, but also in Amsterdam, I had got to know various, uh, through Van Weingarten, I got to know uh, students there, and in particular, Jaco de Bauker and I uh, spent a lot of time together. And then uh, in the summer of uh, <clears throat> 1969, while we were on holiday, I wrote up the uh, notes of the uh, Scott de Bauker uh, approach which I then lectured on when I went to Vienna at the end of the summer. And I think there must have been then uh, very soon after that, another meeting of W2.2. But that's over 70 years ago, 
or 60 years ago, I can't remember all the details of wh uh, when I met uh, people. <clears throat> but it was because of the WG 2.2 meeting that I got to know Strachey. And so I, I decided that uh, after I had accepted the offer from Princeton, that I would ask for the first semester on leave so that I could work with Strachey. <clears throat> and that's how I went to Oxford to work with him uh, at his programming research group uh, in the fall semester of 1969. <clears throat> oh. So of course, <clears throat> there was a lot of activity. Uh, I also met uh, Landon then who was close associate of uh, Strachey and so that was that was how I got uh, to have the connection with him uh, directly there. So that's part of our main story, but can it, it's not perhaps a sideline, but another part is that you did move to Princeton. A, could you tell us from Stanford? We haven't covered how that came about. I, I took the sabbatical from Stanford 68, 69. Yeah. And while we were in uh, Amsterdam, Donald Davidson, the philosopher who was chair of the department at uh, Princeton came to Amsterdam and he recruited me to go to Princeton. I had known him very well, of course, from Stanford where he was a long-term professor, mm -hmm. but then he had moved to uh, Princeton, uh, I forget, 67, 68, sometime around there. <clears throat> and then uh, it was his influence on me that uh, convinced me to uh, move to move to Princeton, where of course I'd been as a graduate student. Uh, but then uh, after I accepted the offer, Davidson, much to my annoyance, moved to Rockefeller, where he got a very uh, big appointment at uh, Rockefeller University, who was where they were starting up various academic uh, uh, departments. And so uh, he wasn't at Princeton when I finally arrived in Princeton. You mentioned to me that when you moved to Princeton, uh, you, as was natural, you continued your association with Goodall. I don't know if you want to mention anything about that. Uh, further part of your association with him? Well, of course, as a graduate student, when I was uh, connected with uh, Georg Kreisel, who was very, very close to Gödel, I met Gödel many times. And then uh, after I uh, had uh, gone to Berkeley, I wrote various papers in set theory and Gödel had taken account of those uh, papers. And so uh, we had those connections. But there was a period when <clears throat> he had uh, been uh, somewhat ill and he was afraid he was going possibly to die. And so he had a number of notes and things like that that he wanted to have preserved. So he contacted me in Princeton to help him try to preserve those notes. One of them was his ontological proof of the existence of God. And then I very unfortunately at a seminar at the Princeton uh, philosophy department spoke about the proof and modal logic that he had for the existence of God. And uh, the one page of notes from that somehow got out into the outer world. And so uh, hundreds of people by now have commented on Gödel's proof and modal logic of the existence of God uh, it's an interesting uh, sidelight that my good colleague uh, Christoph Bentzmiller in Berlin uh, worked very hard in implementing modal logic in uh, the Isabel theorem prover. And he showed that Gödel's original proof had a logical flaw in it, but the proof that uh, I had given in the seminar uh, uh, using just my usual background in uh, modal logic was a correct proof from the uh, uh, assumptions. Uh, and uh, so he has a very amusing uh, lecture on that, uh, updating the information on the ontological proof. Uh, there, there's also quite a section in Gödel's 
collected works that Saul Pfefferman uh, edited uh, about the ontological proof. I would like never to hear about the ontological proof again. <laughs> uh, I, I don't accept it. My feeling is uh, if you assume what you want to prove, you'll eventually prove it. So I really don't think that it's a conclusive proof, but I'll let other people decide that. And please don't ask me any more about it. Was that how you got interested in computer theorem proving? Perhaps not. Uh, well, no, no, the, the, the work of Christoph Bensmiller is much, much later, just uh, uh, yes. uh, uh, since 2000 there. So ah. uh, uh, that, that has no connection with it. It's just that uh, he, he is an outstanding expert in uh, various uh, theorem proving systems and particularly Isabel that was uh, developed with uh, Larry Paulson and the people in Munich. And uh, uh, so that's, that's, that's very recent history there. I see. Okay, okay, thank you. So cycling back, you went then to, to Oxford and you, with a semester leave to Oxford, and there you produced a spectacular series of papers, which laid, I think, the foundation other people do for the modern scientific study of programming languages including the needed underlying mathematics. One place to begin the discussion, which is perhaps the first of those papers, is the paper in LCF, which brought in the use of partially ordered sets and connected to work in recursion theory. Can you talk about this, this, this really important work? Well, uh, things leading up to that go back to uh, uh, some of the original uh, researchers like Claney and then Myhill and Shepherdson, and also uh, Hartley Rogers and Friedberg, because they wrote about uh, operators on uh, recursive spaces of recursive functions. And uh, in particular, both uh, Myhill and Shepherdson and uh, Rogers and Friedberg wrote about enumeration operators, and I knew about that work. But uh, a key thing that motivated me before I got to uh, Strachey came from uh, the thesis of uh, Richard Platek mm -hmm. at uh, Stanford. Uh, Claney had introduced, had gone on from ordinary computation to infinitary computation because he was interested in descriptive set theory and higher order, uh, higher order operators. And so, uh, Richard Platek had transferred that into working on uh, partially ordered spaces of functionals. Uh, and uh, I was one of the uh, uh, advisors on his, on his thesis. And so I had had a lot of that uh, there. Of course, much earlier, Claney had pointed out that if you take ordinary recursion and think of uh, operators, they have a finitary uh, principle that uh, any single value of an operator on functions is uh, uh, obtained by only a finite amount of information about the input function that you're putting on. So if you're thinking about operators, say from partial functions to partial functions, there, there's a, a reduction to finite amount of information. Of course, uh, Claney's uh, uh, advanced theory and the Platek, uh, where you have to uh, go up to a higher order computation, that isn't true. It doesn't depend on a finite amount of information. It can depend on the whole uh, whole function. Uh, but I had that uh, background in mind. And so uh, after I met Strachey and found out that he was depending so much in a very formal way on uh, type-free lambda calculus, I told him it would be much better if you thought about operators typed. In other words, you start with say partial functions and then you think of functionals mapping partial functions to partial functions. And that formulation could be set up in a way 
uh, analogous to what Platek was using for the infinitary computations. And so that's how I wrote that paper to, on LCF to try to convince Strachey that it would be better to use uh, uh, for modeling uh, because it, it had a, a simple mathematical uh, foundation there uh, that it would be better to use uh, those uh, monotone functionals. Of course, they should be monotone because they're taking as a computation. So as you find out more and more about your input functions, then you get more and more output about your output functions. And so that monotonicity, which was similar to what Platek used in the higher order uh, cases uh, would, would be natural. And so that's why I wrote that paper, that LCF paper. But then in November of that year, I think it was a Saturday morning, I was lying on the bed in the guest room of the flat that we rented in uh, Oxford. Uh, I oh, thought yes. to myself that morning in November, that, wait a minute. I know for all these functions of functions of functionals of functionals that I wrote about in the LCF paper, that at each level, there's a notion of finite amount of information. There's a countable basis for the functions such that every one of those functions at every type is the limit of the finite approximations to the things and that this idea of finite approximations passes on from one type to the next type when you take functionals over the previous type. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, this is very similar to what originally Cantor did for the uh, rational numbers, the rational numbers as a ordered set can be thought of as the limit of finite ordered sets as you subdivide things into smaller and smaller pieces, eventually you get, uh, you get the uh, infinite set uh, as the limit. Maybe there is a space of monotone functions, that's the limit of all the spaces at the finite types because the uh, bases of things of finite amount of information would keep expanding and complicating itself, but in a monotone way so that it would pass to the limit. And so I realized that there must be a limit space. And then I worked out the details of that very shortly. And so uh, I told, had to come to tell Strachey, oh no, look what happened. After all the criticisms I made of untyped lambda calculus, it turns out that there is a mathematical meaning to the untyped lambda calculus by thinking of a function space of infinite dimension. And so that's how I developed the idea of the D infinity model. Uh, and then I lectured on that and many people came to hear about that in the late fall of uh, 1969. I'm curious, what did, how did Strachey react? Oh, he was very pleased. And uh, he immediately, he uh, immediately, uh, adopted thinking of it, things in uh, that way, uh, there, there, was no, there was no question because, I mean, he had lots of experience of utilizing lambda calculus in discussing properties of programs, but then this provided a model for the lambda calculus mm. uh, in, in the model based on principles of recursive function theory that were well understood. So yeah. he didn't have to, he didn't have to uh, think of it as an abstract formalistic uh, trick. It really had a mathematical mathematical meaning. Just cycling back to LCF, I just wanted to check something. 
Uh, so I saw some correspondence between you and Robin Milner once, and so you were helpful and influential in Robin's initial work on LCF, which became a major thing. Can you speak about your relationship with Robin at all? Well, he was at Stanford, and this is 10 years later. Was uh, it 10 years later? Oh, I see. Yes, okay. yes it was 78, 79, when uh, I was on a sabbatical at Xerox Park, uh, Milner had been in Stanford for some time. And uh, that was when he started uh, thinking about the uses of LCF and uh, making a connection with uh, uh, computer-based theorem proving. But uh, it, uh, that, that there's a 10 year, there's a 10 year gap uh, uh, before he started that after the discovery of the original model. Of course, Milner was familiar with uh, many things uh, in the meantime, but uh, I don't think he started on his theorem proving until 79, if, I, if my memory doesn't, does it fail me. 78, 70, probably it was 78 then. I was on sabbatical at Xerox Park, 78, 79. I had gone right. there at the invitation of Jim Morris, who then eventually uh, came back to Pittsburgh uh, and uh, when I was at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, but at that time at uh, 78, 79, I was gone there to Xerox Park to work with Jim Morris, but he was trying to decide whether to become a manager and we never had any time to work together at the time. What happened instead was that uh, 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 see, this was in the period when I had left, after three years, I left, I, I left uh, Princeton to go to Oxford because I had completely out of the blue, as far as I was concerned, the offer of the chair to be the first professor of mathematical logic at Oxford. And so uh, in uh, 72, 73 about, I went to Oxford in hopes to work with uh, Strachey. But then in 78, 79, I took sabbatical from uh, Oxford to come to California at the invitation of Jim Morris at Xerox Park. Uh, as I said, we didn't have any time to work uh, together. However, while I had been at uh, Oxford, I wrote up the papers on continuous lattices. Uh, you can think of it this way. The original D infinity model was a very special case of a partially ordered set and a lattice that had some interesting properties. But as so happens in mathematics, if there's one interesting example of a structure, there must be lots of interesting examples of the structure. And so, I expanded the idea that uh, included the model for lambda calculus to more general idea of uh, partially ordered uh, lattices, which uh, I, I called continuous lattices because everything depended upon analysis of the topology of the lattices and the continuity of the function spaces. The use of the, con the continuous functions in order to get the category of function spaces uh, uh, that was uh, appropriate to those kind of structures. And uh, so uh, after I wrote my paper on continuous lattices, I was contacted by uh, mathematicians at uh, Tulane University in Louisiana. Carl Hoffman was the uh, main uh, professor there and he had uh, various associates and uh, students uh, with him there. They had been working on topology and lattice theory for a very long time, and they realized that their category of lattices was the same as my category of lattices. And so that's how uh, I uh, uh, connected up with the uh, Carl Hoffman School. Then at uh, Xerox Park, we put our work together and I used the uh, secretary and the computer at Xerox Park in order to typeset this book uh, with 
uh, uh, Hoffman and his uh, uh, associates and myself as a co-author there. Uh, I took their notes and my notes and other things and we put together uh, this book. Uh, I was then able to get uh, Springer Verlag to publish it, but they wouldn't publish it in a standard series. They published it as a special uh, uh, publication only because I'd had it so long uh, association with Springer Verlag. And so they very kindly decided to publish it, but they didn't put it in any of the standard series. But Klaus Kaimel, who's one of the authors there, uh, uh, not long after that, Carl uh, Hoffman went to Darmstadt. Uh, he, he was originally from Germany, and so he had a, a call from uh, Germany and decided to go back to Germany. And so he moved to uh, Darmstadt, where he had the rest of his career. And Klaus Kaimel uh, was a faculty member there. And so then at the end of the century, Klaus Kaimel worked incredibly hard. The late, I'm sorry to say, the late Klaus mm -hmm. Kaimel worked terribly hard to update everything and make a new edition with many, many new results. And also he put in a gigantic bibliography of the development there. And so uh, that was published in 2003 now by Cambridge University Press. And so the bibliography of this book will give you historical background of many things, not only from my work, but also from the uh, topological lattices uh, point of view there. So I recommend that for tracing the history of uh, development. And it's a testament to the very hard work that Klaus Kaimel did in order to preserve and update the development of the ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Klaus was a wonderful man. So also, he uh, spent a lot of time with the Domains Workshop. I hope after someone will take up after the pandemic is over that Domains Workshops, uh, there were 13 or 14 of them, I don't remember now, uh, that will have get togethers again once we can travel. So there's, there's many threads to take up in that story. What well, one last thread though, is you talk of lattices, but eventually people began to think things should be more general than lattices. And in particular, you invented things, which I think are called Scott domains. Can you say a little there? How, how did you come to that invention? No, 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 that's a, direct outgrowth of the original uh, construction. Uh, those are, well, you don't necessarily have to have a lattice with a top. You can have just a lower part of a lattice, a semi-lattice, uh, which, which is, so to speak, half of a, of a, of a uh, complete lattice. And so uh, it turned out that using the top element in computability theory, it's a kind of idea of a breakdown or inconsistency or something really isn't very appropriate for understanding uh, how you would compute with these operators. And so uh, the, maybe the Scott domains are just what you get by taking the original domain theory, which is lattices and taking only the lower half of it so that you don't have to fool around with the top, which doesn't have very uh, natural interpretations when you think of uh, any kind of compiling or operational uh, activities with, uh, with the uh, things that you're computing with. So uh, uh, that, that's a probably incomprehensible explanation, but uh, it was the elimination of the top element that led to the other domain theory. And so, of course, that's included and that's fully mentioned in the uh, Kaimel biography and uh, the group there, or background on that is fully covered in that. What, yeah. I, what I should mention was 
that straight chief while I was at Princeton in the early 70s, he came for a visit. And so we finished our paper on mathematical semantics, as we called it. It was only a little bit later that it seemed better to say denotational semantics uh, to distinguish more, more clearly from axiomatic semantics of the kind that Tony Hoare was uh, promoting. And of course, uh, to distinguish it from operational semantics that you promoted so uh, very, very strongly. In fact, you pretty well with your PISA notes eliminated people working on denotational semantics for a long time because it was more important to uh, use the implementational ideas that you, that you put into operational semantics in order to uh, get results. Uh, of course, I would say today, axiomatic, denotational, operational semantics all meld together. And uh, the question is to take which aspects of which you want to do for an analysis or a proof or uh, for uh, uh, giving the foundations for some kind of implementation. You choose what is appropriate for the particular thing you want to uh, accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just want to perhaps emphasize, maybe just to make a point that is too obvious for you to say, but in doing those mathematical stroke denotational semantics of programming languages, that was a kind of continuation or extension of Tarski's ideas on logic and in a different direction, Montague's ideas on natural language. So with that, you really uh, completed the idea of giving semantics to languages, artificial or natural. So I think that's a very important uh, thing to have done. So did you see yourself as working in such a way or was it just a technical problem? No, no, I would think, no, I think it was, uh, uh, it, it absolutely does go back to Tarski uh, for uh, having the need to have semantics, you see. Gödel himself, uh, after Tarski's definition of truth said, oh, he knew that it was obvious anyway, mm -hmm. but yes. it was uh, Tarski trying to make it uh, how to have general theories of semantics, which also then carried over to other kinds of logic, modal logic and so on. Okay, so, so now, now uh, a trivial question, I'm just curious if you know the answer or what the answer might be. As you said, you were the very first professor of mathematical logic at Oxford. So there's a huge tradition of Oxford, a huge tradition of logic going back, goodness knows how many years in Britain. Do you have any idea why they got round to having a chair in logic at Oxford? What was the, what happened there? Well, uh, uh, Michael Dummett, the philosopher, of course, who uh, uh, is very, very important in the history of uh, logic. Again, the late Michael Dummett, alas, but also uh, at Merton College, John Lucas, uh, the philosopher, mm -hmm. also very much are concerned with logic. And there was uh, a need felt for uh, teaching of formal logic. There were lots of the philosophers who spoke about philosophical logic uh, over many, many uh, decades, but there was a feeling that there was a need for teaching of uh, formal logic there. And so uh, I'm, I'm sure it was Lucas and Dummett who uh, proposed the idea that there should be a professorship. Uh, and uh, uh, that's eventually the chair that that, that I went to. Of course, I accepted the chair uh, to work with Strachey. But at the same time that I came there, Strachey was given a personal chair, not an established chair, but a personal chair just for him in computing, as he called it. He didn't like the phrase computer science. He said, I do computing. And so he had, was professor of computing uh, there. But it turned out, much to my surprise, that Oxford is ruled by its academics 
through an infinite number of committee meetings. They don't have administrators the same way that, that uh, universities and states have. The academic community really pretty much governs itself through all kinds of boards and uh, committees. So Strachey had to be on many committees. I had to be on many committees. Gandhi, who uh, was a reader there, had built up a lot of teaching on the mathematics side in logic and uh, recursive function theory. So there were lots and lots of students, fortunately, to supervise, but it meant both for Strachey starting a new department and my coming into uh, being both a professor of mathematics and a professor of philosophy, there was all the administrative and supervision work to do and Strachey and I never had a long period to work together again. Unfortunately, he became ill with a liver ailment and uh, died uh, in, in the about 1975 or so, very sadly. And uh, so I didn't have any uh, chance to, uh, to work closely with him again there. Of course, there were various uh, associates and graduate students uh, around him, and there was quite a lot of uh, activity, but it was sad that I really didn't have the close uh, collaboration with Strachey again. After his death, the university decided to have an established chair in uh, computing, eventually turned into computer science, and the first uh, one to be appointed to that was Tony Hoare. And so Tony Hoare came from uh, uh, Ireland, uh, Belfast uh, to, to uh, Oxford then uh, after Strachey's uh, death when that, when that appointment was made. Yeah, yes, that was very sad. Uh, you mentioned uh, Robin Gandhi in, in passing. He's an important figure. He was Turing's only piece. You shouldn't have understood correctly. Understood you were, understand you were a close colleague of Gandhi's, of Robin's? Oh, yes, over many years, even before my coming to Oxford, I knew him. And of course, all the time, all the time that I was in Oxford that uh, decade. Absolutely. Yeah, also a wonderful man. So, a slight, a slight, well, going back to logic just a little bit, another interest of yours in Oxford. Well, was continuing an interest of yours in, in uh, intuitionistic logic and sheaf models, and you started the peripatetic seminar, which I counted as now over a hundred editions. It was going to be one hundred and six if it wasn't for the pandemic. So, how did this renewed interest come about, and in which way did the sheaf theoretic approach present a significant new opportunity for you? Well, I I had uh, lots of interchanges and colleagues and things connected with category theory. Uh, and so it, it happened that in the UK, there were a number of different groups, uh, Cambridge, uh, Sussex, other places uh, that were interested in the connections between category theory and logic. And uh, the students at Oxford that were uh, uh, working with Gandhi and me, uh, principal one is Mike Foreman, your colleague mm -hmm. now in uh, Edinburgh, while he was a student there, uh, 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 we became very taken up with the questions and the things that people were uh, raising in connection, connecting category theory and, and uh, logic. And so uh, it was informal connections between people in various places that uh, started the peripatetic seminar. We called it peripatetic because uh, it was informally organized. Everybody uh, on his own funds, uh, they just got together uh, uh, once a term or so uh, uh, in order to have these uh, meetings to exchange ideas. It was also very, very uh, helpful to students in various places 
to have uh, a place to uh, present ideas and to to give talks and and to meet people and so it became a, a very popular thing to do then <clears throat> the group decided that it would be good to have a summer conference and so we applied for support uh, from the government for to have the conference in uh, Durham and so that arose from our our connections with uh, each other in the UK at the Peripatetic Seminar. And then we had the big conference in Durham that brought people from all over the world and was a very successful, very successful conference. You mentioned the other thing. Uh, it's uh, 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 the connection with intuitionistic logic because the uh, Louvere Tierney idea of topos theory, which came from topological considerations, mm. led to logical notions of higher types that were intuitionistic, not classical in the sense of the law of the excluded middle. And so that was what brought up intuitionistic logic through topos theory. But going back to Tarski, Gödel, other people, modal logic led to interpretations of intuitionistic logic. And so it was quite clear that mm -hmm. models that people had thought of in connection with modal logic and pe what people thought of in terms of intuitionistic logic of topos theory made that connection with intuitionistic logic and models from one side or the other were appropriate for uh, discussion there. So the, the, the strands there from modal logic and from category theory melded then through the impetus of studying topos theory. Yeah, it was a vast unification. Uh, so one connection there to computer science, the, the, talking about category theory, was you looked at the connection between category theory and type theory. Also, Lambeck was involved in that. And that's another very important connection. It kind of completes the propositions as type connection. It makes a, another connection. How did that come about for you? Well, it was just natural to do. I mean, <laughs> types are already uh, there in computability theory. So uh, uh, I, I mean that there, there, there are uh, the connections with intuitionistic logic and the realizability interpretation that Claney originally uh, put forward uh, also uh, uh, connect. And so people like uh, Martin Hyland uh, and uh, collaborators that he had made the connection between uh, the category theory and the realizability interpretation there. And so mm -hmm. all of those things uh, 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 came together uh, through trying to explain on a higher level there uh, in the style of category theory as to uh, what were the assumptions necessary in order to have the, 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 the broadest view of what was going on. So I see. It, it was quite yeah. a natural, natural outgrowth. Yeah, well, that's a very nice way of thinking about it. Thank you. Uh, Oxford is a huge number of major figures in the UK intellectual landscape quite generally. And I knew you know, I knew Michael Atia, Isaiah Berlin, Michael Dummett, Roger Penrose, all kinds of people. Do you have any particular recollections that come to mind of any of those people? I'll only tell one story about Isaiah Berlin. He was he was a wonderful storyteller. My wife and I had a delightful experience that we were coming back to Oxford and met him on the train platform and rode with him uh, in the compartment. And he told story after story. It was a, a delightful hour with him. Uh, I felt that sometimes his stories were 
expanded by what I would call creative remembering, but it was really delightful. But then there was a certain period when the BBC uh, made a big program of uh, English philosophers. And uh, it was a movie and uh, was given at the movie theater in Oxford there. And one of the uh, sections was devoted to Isaiah Berlin. Now he had a rather thick accent. I think he's originally Lithuanian, is that correct? Uh, in any case, he came uh, uh, from, from, uh, from, from that side of, uh, of Europe. Uh, he had quite a, quite a thick accent. Uh, and he was interviewed for this BBC program in the movie. And we bumped into him coming out of the movies. And he said, I, I couldn't understand the word I said. I, could, I, I couldn't understand the word I said. <laughs> uh, very, very fond memories of him. And of course, there are many other exceptional characters there. I have to say about, uh, about comparing Oxford to the States Mm. Uh, of course, it's in a way unique to Cambridge and Oxford, the college system. It would be hard to invent a college system that developed over centuries there. But the colleges were clubs. The thing that I missed on leaving Oxford, it was not the committees. It was the college, because at the various college lunches and dinners and so on, you met the most interesting people from all possible subjects. And I had so many interesting conversations uh, at Merton College. Merton College was a very, very fine atmosphere. And I would say that was the key thing that I miss and still miss from the time in Oxford in the 70s. So Dana, coming to the end, there's a, a kind of final question, which has a very final question type aspect to it. You've contributed very well, we've seen in these talks, that you've contributed hugely, very widely over a period of almost 50 years. And so that's a long time, a lot of experience. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were in some about anything really looking backwards or looking forwards, what, what you might wish to say. I would say that the contributions I made were very much motivated by the teaching and the great luck I had of really uh, excellent students, many of whom became very, very close personal family friends. It was the inspiration of the students that really uh, motivated me. That's why I'm absolutely furious with Brexit which is breaking up the interchange of students between Europe and the UK uh, as we speak here. It's already reported today that there are uh, bad things happening to Scotland on account of the Brexit uh, arrangements there. It's students can get interests for many different reasons, but then they have to move around to get to the places where the right teachers are there. And so the, the uh, having the possibility of students is extremely important. I remember very strongly Mrs. Thatcher in the 70s when she instituted uh, full fees for foreign students uh, coming to the UK. Many departments closed down because more than half of their graduate students came from other countries. The free mobility of students is absolutely important. And I was extremely lucky just by historical accident that I was in places where I had many, many uh, students. And so whatever I did, I really think I attributed to their inspiration. Uh, we could work on problems together. And I miss that very much now in retirement because once you retire, you become sort of a ghost. And uh, I, I really, wish I had some students to work with even at the present day. Thank you. I almost wish to say nothing because what you said shouldn't be followed. But just let me take a moment just to thank you for your patience 
and your time for these interviews. Gordon, I thank you for all the work you've done and I thank you for this decades long friendship that we've had. It will continue. Thank you, goodbye.